Okay, I guess, uh, guess we'll go ahead and uh, get started again. So uh, uh, during the break, anybody, uh, anybody think of any other questions or comments? Okay. Is everybody able to, to hear pretty good? Okay, great, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's good. All right. Um, okay, uh, so now I'm just going to, uh, we'll go kind of quickly, but just want to give a, a little bit of detail. And there's some articles out on the table there and some books that, that will uh, cover, uh, will provide detail also. But I don't want to, want to make sure we again try to get through uh, all of the material uh yeah, that we'd planned for uh, the, the two-day seminar. And so I uh, so don't want to go too fast, but just want to give some definitions and then give a little detail. But again, please, uh, uh, you know, please ask questions if you have any. Again, it keeps it uh, a lot of times. Just want to make sure, again, that we're covering everything, that everyone's understanding, uh, you know, or that it's really that I'm speaking clearly, I'm explaining it clearly, uh, because, again, hopefully some of this will be, uh, be useful just, again, when you're out uh, evangelizing. So I want to start out uh, definitions. Uh, when people talk about creation, uh, I just go back to uh, Genesis uh, 1, and really what I just focused on, this was the verses that are talking about life, because uh, one of the things we'll uh, spend the next, uh, uh, this next session on is, is talking a lot about life. Uh, and, of course, so, so Genesis 1.1, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.11 then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. Genesis 1.20 on day 5, then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. Then Genesis 1.24, day 6, then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. Uh, now, atheism evolution it actually predates uh, Christianity. And so it's interesting here, I've had uh, someone point out that, uh, you know, point this out to me. Yeah, well, you know, how can, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because this is before the scientific age. You know, everybody would admit that. But it was already in existence. And so if I had a person almost trying to establish the credibility of evolution by saying, well, it's even older than Christianity. But when you think about it, what they'd really admitted was it's just another religion. Uh, it's a false religion, you know, but it's, uh, uh, but there's, you know, so its foundation had nothing to do with science. Uh, 2,500 years ago, 6th century BC, a Greek philosopher, Naximander, said that, you know, life arose from mud, exposed to sunlight, that subsequently evolved into man. Now, when we were first starting to, uh, I guess, be scientific or make observations, uh, actually had uh, what people thought was scientific evidence for life making itself. And so that was in the Middle Ages. And you can try this experiment today. What you do is you know, take, uh, take some soup and leave it out on the counter for a few days, and stuff will start growing on it. And so uh, it still works today. Uh, and so, so the, and, and if you uh, say you put uh, fruit out, you might get fruit flies. If you wanted to make higher life forms, say you, you might leave trash out in the alley. Uh, you could make rats that way. You know, so there are all these ways uh, that people thought that somehow life was spontaneously generating. And so finally, uh, 1859 to 1861, this is when Louis Pasteur, he performed the experiments that were showed that spontaneous generation wasn't happening. And we'll talk uh, not too much about his experiments, but basically what he'd do is he'd take a broth and he would sterilize it. And then the uh, broth that he let be exposed to air, well, it would still have stuff growing in it in the broth that he kept sealed so it wouldn't be exposed to air, nothing would grow. And so he was basically showing that those microbes, they were coming in from the air, so life was not spontaneously generating. But it's really interesting, if you look at the dates of when this is all happening, this is 1859 to 1861. Well, 1859, that's exactly when Darwin published his Origin of the Species. So the timing here, uh, you know, a lot of people will say if Pasteur had just been 10 years earlier, you know, Darwin would have never gotten any traction. But it was just, just the uh, timing when people were having these big discussions. And so here's uh, science, you know, proving life can't make itself. And, of course, Origin of the Species didn't really deal with life making itself. But even in 1871, you know, Darwin was making these arguments. That's when he made his, his famous, uh, you know, life spontaneously rising in some warm little pond as a result of sunlight acting on various organic salts. Again, just you know, kind of fairy tales that he was making up as, you know, ways to, to try to explain this. Uh, and at the same time, this is when there's this huge debate going on, because it wasn't really until 1876 when everybody finally believed Louis Pasteur, because there were others 
out there, they were performing, uh, they would claim that they could make life whenever they wanted to. And it wasn't until 1876, it was actually Pastor and Chamberlain identified the error in these experiments where people were saying, no, they could cause spontaneous generation. And so a lot going on in that 25-year, 30-year period or so. Uh, but that's really when uh, uh, evolution kind of took hold of everybody's imagination. And so, but again, even at this stage, it was really, it was science, you know, against evolution. Then, uh, so where we're at now, uh, some people call it the neo-Darwinian synthesis, you know, other names for evolution, but basically it says the universe spontaneously formed 13.8 billion years ago, solar system formed 4.5 billion years ago, uh, living organisms spontaneously arose, uh, mutations in DNA are sometimes beneficial, such mutations are past the next generation, increasing the fitness of an organism's offspring. Uh, these beneficial mutations increase the likelihood that an organism will live to reproductive maturity, and then over time, these beneficial mutations result in new species. And so that's a summary. Different books would, would phrase it a different way. But that's kind of a summary of what, they, uh, what evolutionists will, will believe today. Uh, and so maybe an analogy, uh, when you start talking about life from non-life, uh, creation, uh, one way to think about it would be just saying that, you know, complex machines, you know, you could say computers, cars, space shuttles, uh, they're designed and built by an intelligent creator. In other words, uh, because that's really when you get that first life. Until you have that first life, you don't have things like natural selection, you don't have mutation. Uh, the neo-Darwinian synthesis would require that complex machines, and this would be computers, cars, space shuttles, they'd have to assemble and operate themselves uh, via random chemical reactions. And so it's kind of two, you know, very... Uh, opposing views, you know, and this is again talking about the origin of life. When you start talking about the diversity of life, okay, why do we see all of the different life around us? Well, one way to think about that is you have to explain where all the genetic information would come from. And so when uh, even a bacteria has a lot of genetic information in it, and uh, but the for that bacteria to somehow turn it into all the other life forms that we see around us, it would have to somehow add or create just an incredible amount of genetic information. And so you know, where did that information come from? So you have the first analogy was how did life make itself? And that really is the case of, you know, did, a, what, did someone make a space shuttle or did space shuttles just spontaneously arise? Except the only problem with that analogy is life is more complicated than a space shuttle. Uh, this analogy, it's okay, uh, I have to somehow create all of this information. And so creation would say, well, given a complete encyclopedia, write a sentence, you know, in this case I said just about butterflies. And the point is, I have all of this genetic information. That would be the genetic information that God put in the original creation, and you're just selecting from that genetic information. But all that genetic information was there in the original creation. Uh, the neo-Darwinian synthesis somehow requires that all that information be made. And so it would be very analogous to saying, okay, I gave somebody a sentence about butterflies, now, now go off and write an entire encyclopedia. And so that's kind of the, the two, two processes. So those analogies clear, those processes clear? What we're talking about. Okay. Uh, so we'll get into a little more detail. I mentioned this uh, in the last session, but the other one, you know, we were talking about is it reasonable? You know, in other words, yeah, all these, you know, we're teaching this as facts, and it makes no sense. Uh, when I'm at work, I, I usually don't use the word reasonable. I use the word scientific because you'll have people, again, they'll, be, they'll come up and they'll claim, well, you know, I'm, I'm being scientific, you know, somehow by, you know, believing that life just made itself. Uh, but so the question would be, is it scientific uh, to have faith that something happens spontaneously? In other words, life arising from non-life that we've been unable to duplicate given our best laboratories, our smartest scientists, and virtually unlimited financial resources. And uh, I, I've never, never had a person tell me it's scientific. Uh, the closest someone came, they, they left my office, and he's Great guy, you know. Uh, so it wasn't, uh, you know, in very, we say on friendly terms. And I saw he just didn't want to talk about it. About three months later, he comes back in. And he says, "Well, uh, you know, it's not scientific, but that's still what I believe." And you think, "Well, that was kind of a dead end," but and it kind of was. But but the point, but the, uh, uh, but at least it got him to admit that you know, no, this is just where he's chosen to put his faith. And so he's really saying that even though all of science tells us life doesn't make itself, he's chosen to put his faith in saying that, no, you know, life must have made itself. And so that's, uh, uh, so at least it got him to that point where he's realizing that that's now, you know, now his, his religion, I guess we'd say. A um, few uh, discussions. Now, some of these are, uh, they've become, uh, I'm not sure, they're, uh, uh, some of these experiments, uh, even the evolutionists are now starting to admit really didn't make any sense. 
but I think most of the ones we'll be talking or didn't, weren't really relevant, I guess you would say. Uh, and so that's one of the things is if you're, if you have, if you're taking biology or you know something in biology, you go ahead and get a copy of their uh, textbook and see what's, uh, you know, what kind of the latest update is. So the ones we're going to go through, I think they're still in almost all of the biology textbooks. Uh, and if they, but sometimes there are little permutations on them. And so just be aware of that. The only reason I mentioned that is the Miller Year experiment. Um, I had a biology textbook, my daughter had a biology textbook. And they're both, uh, two of the authors were the same. Uh, there were four authors total, and two are the same in both our textbooks. And in mine, it was just like, well, the Miller Year experiment, by that just proved life makes itself. You know, I mean, it was just, boy, just, kind of, and hers, I mean, it had, it was, it, mine was about this long, hers is about this long with all the, well, yeah, it really wasn't that relevant, you know, you know, yeah, but yeah, but we still like it because we can't do any better. You, you, you know, I mean, it's, so it was, uh, so it's kind of interesting, just the, uh, and that was only, well, it was quite a ways apart, you know, but it was, uh, but it's just interesting, uh, you know, how, uh, how fluid these things are because people will realize this makes no sense, and rather than admitting, well, yeah, we're going to give up on this. Yeah, you know, people, they'll try to adjust things or tweak things. Uh, so anyway, Miller, your experiment is an attempt to simulate conditions under which the theory of evolution uh, would, you know, supposedly predict life could spontaneously generate, uh, basically pass water, ammonia, methane, hydrogen uh, through a spark. Uh, couldn't have any oxygen there because that would destroy the building blocks of life. Uh, amino acids were formed, and then uh, the books will say, uh, and I've got the reference for the books at the, at the bottom if anyone wants it, the textbooks would say that that showed the basic building blocks of life can assemble spontaneously. So they're trying to build up this thing that, okay, we're showing this evidence for evolution. And that's why, again, uh, you read this in a textbook, but the uh, just go back to, okay, wait, if this works, then why don't we just go do this and make it, you know, make it work? Yeah, had a question or comment? So this, this one was, uh, this, oh, sorry. Do you know what year this experiment so, was so conducted? This, oh, that was back in the 50s. Uh, 1850s? 50, yeah, 1952, 53. Yeah, okay. Thank you. That. Yeah. Um, so it, it was, uh, yeah, it was a uh, uh, while ago, but it's still, you know, still being reported on. Um, and this, uh, this was actually out of a teacher's edition from 1998. The yeah, other, this particular quote was 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 taken. Uh, and then this is just a schematic of the experiment itself. Um, and so, so that's what was taught. Uh, so again, you can either. Uh, what we talked about the last session is just point out, you know, just go back to the old, well, wait, if it could happen randomly, again, every elementary school should have, you know, just your, your afternoon where you go off and make life, you know, I mean, it would be kind of a cool experiment, you know. Uh, and so uh, if it was so simple that it could happen randomly, so that would be one direction to go. Now, another one is if someone brings a textbook home or some article and says, no, here's all the detail on it, uh, then you can, you know, then you can go up a level and, and talk about some of the details. And so... Uh, so one way to phrase it, and there's different ways you can phrase it, is to say, well, okay, so here's what's taught. Now let's look at what's not taught. Uh, you remember Paul Harvey, you know, rest of the story? Okay, so it's kind of analogous to that. So you say, okay, yeah, here's your textbook, here's what it's teaching you. Uh, but wow, you know, here, here's some of the things it's not mentioning. So the first one that's not mentioned, way the Miller-Urey experiment, is that uh, both DNA and proteins, they're molecules, uh, and they can exist in uh, right-handed and left-handed forms. And they're kind of just like mirror images. And so if you think about it, you can you, know, you put your hands together like this. Your you know, fingers can match up, you know, you know, thumb and everything matches up. But you can't put your hands together like that. So it's just there's a different, you know, you could just think of it as one analogy for right-handed and left-handed form. Uh, but in living systems, a DNA and RNA compose exclusively of right-handed nucleotides. Amino acids and proteins in living systems are only left-handed. Okay? And so... Uh, and so it's a recognized problem. People, they call it racemization. And, uh, well, they basically, there's ways that people have been trying to purify uh, you know, amino acids and uh, nucleotides, and they don't work. You know, we'll talk about that a little more later. But what's just interesting is right, right off the, the bat, you know, the Miller-Urey experiment, it produced an even mix of right-handed and left-handed uh, amino acids, nucleotides. Uh, we'll run the numbers and show why that, that alone just shows that random combinations of those, you'd never get anywhere close to a, you know, a protein or RNA or DNA. And so it's not, it's not then, well, let's look, you know, uh, you, can, you can keep getting into more detail, but you just find out, okay, well, why wasn't that mentioned? You know, in other words, you, you just, you know, they just read this section about how the Miller-Urey experiment shows evolution. But boy, there's some gaping holes there. So you don't have to go much further than just say, you know, why didn't they mention this? And then it's funny, the response is, oh, well, they just didn't want to confuse the student. Well, wait, wait a second. You know, you know you're, uh, you're withholding, you know, vital information from the student after you just told them something, you know, that uh, you're trying to, to have this huge impact on them. Uh, and so it's, uh, so anyway, that's just one, one direction the conversation can go. This is just an example of right-handed, left-handed. Um, 
<clears throat> the reason it has to be left-handed amino acids and right-handed nucleotides is really the, it's not just the chemistry, it's the physical structure of, of uh, uh, proteins and of, you know, DNA and RNA that's also very important. And so uh, when you get to, uh, you have something like a hemoglobin, you know, it's a very complicated molecule where it's actually the, the physical structure of the molecule is important, not just the chemistry. So that's why it has to be all left-handed amino acids. And of course, to get the double helix uh, that we see in a DNA, uh, has to have you know, right-handed nucleotides to, to pack into the, the uh, um, you know, into that particular structure. And so, but the chance chemistry uh, again, it results in this even mix. And so, one of the things you can think about is, say, I have this bucket of amino acids that were made in something like the Miller-Urey experiment. And those amino acids are combining. Now, it turns out amino acids tend to break apart. Uh, they don't combine, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the next slide. But even if they were just randomly combining and somehow build up to the smallest protein, which would be about 70 amino acids, well, the odds of those all being left-handed, it ends up it's, it's um, uh, 1 in 1 followed by 21 zeros. I'll, I'll use a lot of scientific notation. I know most of you are probably familiar with it, but just... Uh, when I say 1 to 10 to the 21, that means 1 and 1 followed by 21 zeros. And so just right there, just that alone says, boy, this isn't working. Because again, it's where are we putting our faith? So you're going to stake your eternity on something that was 1 and 1 followed by 10 to the 21st zeros. And it gets much, much, much worse for evolution. But I'm just saying even just that alone would, would get people, if they would really think about it, would get them to start uh, thinking. Hemoglobin is 574 amino acids. That's 1 and 1 followed by 175 zeros. And so, I just, this is literally just, it'd be like flipping a coin. Uh, if you had a friend that flipped the coin 70 times and came up tails every time, would you think he was just good at flipping tails? I don't know, you probably think something wrong with the coin, right? <laughs> or something, you know, yeah. But anyway, I mean, just, you know, that would be the same thing as saying I could flip a coin uh, 70 times and always come up heads or always come up tails. You know, it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. And so that's, but that's just that, but there's a lot of other things that aren't taught also. You know, I mentioned the watery environment. So you have a real, you have to have this very complex attempt to do things like, well, things were wet and then they dry out and then they're wet and it has to have the perfect pH and the perfect rate of change. You start trying to put together this story, which again, you'll read the story, but if the story were true, why don't we just go do it? And we can't. You know, so just keep thinking. So you'll have a lot of imagination out there, but the way, to me, it knows wrong. Right. Well, if it worked that way, we would just go do it. And we can't even do it on purpose, you know, and we can control everything. And so this is, uh, so one of the things is, uh, you know, again, long strings of amino acids don't exist in water. Only 1% would be two amino acids bonded together. And what that leads us to is, remember that simple protein that's 70 amino acids? Uh, well, that'd be one in one followed by 140 zeros of just having that many amino acids thrown together in a watery environment. So again, that alone says that this, this doesn't work. Um, the, uh, uh, this, this to me is a, a classic sleight of hand because they, you know, they, the books will say, well, they produce, it, the Miller experiment produced amino acids. Uh, that's like me telling you that uh, uh, celery contains arsenic atoms. Okay, that is a true statement. Uh, I don't know if anybody eats celery anyway, but if you did, don't, don't, don't be scared by that because you know, it's not enough to matter. Well, that's really what it came down to this Miller experiment. Yeah, there are amino acids formed, but if you look at the percentages, it wasn't, you know. Uh, not only was it not enough to matter, but you look at what else was produced, and that again shows that this whole approach, you know, isn't going anywhere. It's a uh, two percent of the uh, product was amino acids, um, but the products had to be removed to avoid destruction. But also produced that uh, eighty-five percent of the product was tar, thirteen percent was carboxylic acids, and both of those are toxic to living systems. And so, again, why isn't that mentioned in the textbook? Because it's not. It's a, is this really a science discussion, or is this a Religious discussion. If it's a science discussion, wow, we got some really important things that are just conveniently not mentioned. You know, the left-handed, the right-handed, the oh, these things don't combine together in a watery environment. Oh, yeah, we did produce some amino acids, but we had to separate them out. And oh, by the way, 98% of what we produced would have killed anything that was trying to, you know, move forward. Yeah, so it's a, so it's a, again, just another approach you can use when talking to people. Uh, a lot of controversy over whether the proposed atmosphere could ever have existed. Right now, people are thinking the atmosphere that they proposed to even try to make this experiment work couldn't have existed. Uh, we did send a probe into Jupiter uh, that, you know, again, showed no complex molecules. Jupiter was supposed to be close to the atmosphere they were proposing. And uh, again, all of these have failed to show any credible mechanism even for protein formation. This is a quote from a Sky and Telescope in 96. Um, We'll read the whole thing. Sky and Telescope, you know, it's a very pro-evolution magazine, but they also, they do tend to be, 
one of the more objective magazines on this subject, at least, at least they you know, have in the past. Uh, and it says, uh, the quote is, yet the mass spectrometer found nothing fancier than simple carbon-based species like ethane. There aren't any little critters floating around in the clouds, concludes Neiman, and that's, uh, you know, that's from the 1996 article, because it you know, talks about above that how you know, people like uh, Carl Sagan and others had thought that maybe there was life flying around in the Jovian atmosphere, because this supposedly matched this atmosphere that was required perfectly. Uh, but we sent a probe, and we didn't find anything. Now, what's interesting is the way the media could report this, and a lot of it did. Uh, so C2H6 is ethane, you know, two carbons, you know, six hydrogens. Very, if you just think of it in the vernacular, it's a very simple molecule, but it's actually a complex organic molecule because it has, you know, more than one atom, and it has, uh, and it's organic because it has carbon. And so how do you think they phrased it? You know, you know most of the media says, oh, we found complex organic molecules. And then Sky and Telescope, again, being, to me, more objective, they said, no, this is, you know, this doesn't mean anything. You know, it's just, again, it's a very, uh, you know, sim simple molecule uh, like, like ethane. Um, another point to make is, since I've had uh, someone say, well, no one really understands how long 20 billion years is. You know, and uh, I think he was saying, you know, most of the evolutionists, they'll try to say that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. We'll uh, talk a lot after dinner. You know, the, you know we know... Uh, you know, scientifically and from the Bible, you know, the you know, universe is about 6,000 years old. You know, maybe, you know, there's discussion in that range, but it's, it's certainly less than 10,000 years old. Uh, and so, uh, uh, but they'll say, well, 20 billion years old, well, no one really uh, knows, uh, you know, someone say, well, no one really knows how long 20 billion years is. And so, so this was a quote, this was uh, Thomas Huxley. And this was a debate in 1860. It was a, a kind of a, a famous debate. It says, Thomas Huxley, and he proposed that given six monkeys, six typewriters, and unlimited time, the monkeys would eventually type all the books in the British Library. And so what he was using is a mathematical property of infinity. So it was a really good debater. But again, you have to go back and say, okay, so how does this apply to the real world? And again, it goes back to, okay, I can postulate, well, maybe this and this and this and this happened to somehow out pop life. But you go back to the real world and you realize, no, that's not what's happening. So take this statement, and um, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, a lot of you, you know, if you remember when your kids were real little, or you, you probably have, uh, you probably know people, you have, you know, cousins or relatives, you know, really, you know, it gets to be three or four years old, you're trying to teach them the letters. And so at least when our kids were little, uh, they'd have these little typewriters, and they were basically the 26 letters, and that was it. You know, so you'd have A, B, C, D, and they weren't, you know, they were actually in order. You know, you know, so, uh, uh, so they had the, uh, uh, the 26 letters, uh, and that was it, just to teach them the, the typewriters. Well, say, say you gave the monkeys these typewriters, and the monkeys were being completely random. Okay, and so, you know, you just, you know, so they didn't have any preference. So you could think of like the, you know, maybe the cat walks in the room, and the cat's just this totally random cat, and it just happens to step on random letters. Well, what would be the odds of, of, of hitting a W just randomly? Okay, well, well, there's 26 letters, so it's 1 in 26. Now, if you want to hit a W followed by an E, you'd have a 1 in 26 chance of hitting a W, right? And then the, for the second step, or, you know, punch, or whatever you call it, uh, you have a 1 in 26 chance of hitting the E, so you'd have 1 in 26 times 1 in 26. You'd have a 1 in 676 chance. So just having the cat walk in the room and type W and E, you think, wow, that's pretty impressive. You know, that's a 1 in 676 chance of that happening. Now, if a cat walks in the room and he types W-E-A-R-E, -E, you know, we are, wow. You know, that's 1 in 11,881,376. Uh, so that's, wow, that's really impressive. If a cat comes in and types we are a bunch of monkeys, yeah, you'd think he would say cats, but anyway, okay. But he says, he says we are a bunch of monkeys, so yeah, you really want to get him checked. Uh, because the odds of that happen randomly, that would be 1 in 1.99 yeah, times 10 to the 28th. In other words, basically 1 in two followed by 28 zeros. So that's, you know, that's not, you know, that's just not going to happen. If you want to type, we are a bunch of monkeys trying to type something that's making sense, that's not working yet, but maybe given infinite time. Uh, now, now you're at one in seven, basically 6.89, or seven followed by 135 zeros. Okay, so, uh, so there, there are much more sophisticated books in the British Library. And so even though, you know, you can use these mathematical properties, um, it, it doesn't matter how old the universe is. Uh, and just to give an example, going back to that, well, no one really understands how long 20 billion years is. Yeah, 20 billion years is 6.3 times 10 to the 23rd microseconds. Uh, again, that's a very tiny number compared to even that last uh, you know, string of letters we talked about. Number of atoms in the universe, pretty much everybody's estimate puts it well under 10 to the 80th. 
And again, that's a very small number just compared to the odds of typing that one sentence. And so again, it's not, uh, it's just, it's just not going to happen. I don't know how else to phrase it. Now again, this is much more detail, not, you know, but it just depends on what uh, level people want to, you know, or, or interested in or want to get into. Other things that aren't mentioned, I mean, the example had 96 letters. DNA, the simplest bacteria, it has over a million nucleotide pairs. Uh, chemical letters aren't permanently placed. You know, in a watery environment, again, as we talked about, they, they tend to break apart. Be the analogous to the letter being erased very soon after its type. Uh, and then people will actually write computer programs. There's some leading atheists, and they'll write these computer programs, but they're seeking a predetermined result. So they're totally irrelevant. And so at some point you wonder, does a person not realize that the program you just wrote is completely irrelevant, or is he being intentionally deceptive? Because they'll, they'll have a lot of bluff and bluster saying, oh, I wrote this uh, you know, computer program, and you know, after a certain amount of time it comes up with this you know, exact result. Well, it had a predetermined result it was looking for. So it's completely not related, uh, but that's... Uh, um, and so you'll run across that every now and then also. So again, this, this is, uh, you know, getting into the details. Um, but again, that, you know, I still say, try to, you know, just try to bring the person back to reality. I don't know how else to phrase it. You know, are you really putting your faith in this? You know, you know again, just, you know, some, something like this happening. Uh, and then the other one is just, you know, when you, when you look at the language, and there's a book out on, uh, I'm going to leave here at the congregation called Genetic Entropy. And that's a... A uh, uh, Cornell professor uh, who just did an excellent job. He goes through, uh, used to be an atheist, and then he just gave up on it because he realized that this, this just can't work. And he gives a very, very good, uh, it's technical, but it's also understandable you know, explanation of all the points. But he talks about, uh, talks a lot about DNA. You know, DNA is digital error correcting, redundant, overlapping information storage systems, more sophisticated than anything we've ever uh, contrived. Uh, and so, again, what we're talking about is just trying to get the chemicals together, uh, but it's, you know, it's more than chemicals, like we talked about before. And so one way, uh, I like this analogy, is just if you solder a bunch of wires and switches together, does that create Windows 10? It's, it's totally unrelated. And so we're, we're, even, we're only even just scratching the surface just by talking about the chemistry of life. Uh, this is one of the examples that's, uh, again, it's uh, Dr. Sanford's genetic entropy. Uh, you know, he talks... Uh, uh, you know, DNA sequences being polyfunctional, so you can read them forward, you can read them backwards, you can read them up, you can read them down, you can read them where you skip letters, you can skip four letters, you can, you know, and, they, and it's all, I mean, all these different ways, it, it's incredibly sophisticated. And so he uh, gave this one phrase, if you notice, if you read that phrase in, in Greek, it says something like the sower named Arepo holds the working of the wheels, but you notice you can read that left to right, right to left, you know, up and down. It's really hard to even come up with something that, you know, simple. Uh, you know, that, that, that still works. And that's, again, just, uh, you know, scratching the surface compared to what, uh, what our DNA does. Um, let's see, lately there's been some talk about, uh, I guess what you'd call RNA world. Uh, that was first proposed by Carl Weiss in 1967. Uh, but again, it has the same problems, you know, as the proteins arising, and a lot of them are even more challenging. RNA itself is a very complex molecule. It's less stable than DNA, which is less stable than proteins. Uh, we don't produce uh, the nucleotides in a primordial soup. Uh, the uh, spark discharge experiments don't produce the uh, base cytosine. Uh, cytosine is too unstable to accumulate. Uh, high temperatures, uh, I don't know if you remember about 10 or 15 years ago, there was all these theories about how maybe life arose by hydrothermal vents. You know, it's kind of interesting. We see life down at hydrothermal vents. And it's just, that's just you know, amazing, the life that God created and how adaptable it is. And, you know, uh, and, uh, but they'll try to say, oh, maybe it arose there. Well, it's actually the high temperature actually makes all these theories worse because it makes things even less stable. And so, but again, that, that one, every now and then, will be floating around out there. Uh, same thing, the uh, building blocks have to be one-handed. Uh, you know, can have the uh, even mix. The uh, self-replicating RNA has to be extremely accurate. Uh, RNA synthesis uses specific sequences. Pure chemicals, high concentrations, adjust pH, applies UV light. Uh, enzymes needed are needed for reasonable reaction rates. Um, and then the purine ribonuclides are even harder to manufacture. So actually, I went ahead. There's a, a lot of people attempting to do work in this area. And I got to hear a, a Nobel laureate. He actually won his Nobel Prize for uh, this, uh, work with telomeres uh, talk about this. And he tried his hardest for about an hour and a half. But it's just, you know, it's, they just, I mean, it's just, they're not getting anywhere in any of these fields. You know, they'll, uh, they'll maybe say, well, we made a, a small s string, literally like a few nucleotides long, long that given nutrients, you know, which basically those 
molecules had to be manufactured. Could somehow, you know, maybe have a self-replicating molecule for like three or four times before. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's just an incredible amount of effort going into this. And of course, we're getting nowhere. And that's, you know, again, nowhere close to life. Uh, even, even getting to that point. So, uh, again, just depends on what the person, again, a lot of these slides, just remember if someone throws out RNA world and acts like it's all technical and you're supposed to be intimidated by it, you know, don't, don't be. You know, it's just another one of the, the theories that's being, uh, you know, that will be floated around or being mentioned. Uh, and then finally, I think the other one, I just like going back to what some of the non-Christians said. You know, Carl Sagan, again, he was trying to use the mathematical properties of infinity. Uh, so he would say the... Uh, uh, odds of a single simple protein is about one, one followed by 130 zeros, which isn't, I mean, it's, it's similar to what we were discussing, you know, just going back to basic principles. I'm not sure how he got to the one and one followed by 130 zeros, but uh, so that's why he knew he had to try to make the universe infinitely old. Uh, Fred Hoyle, he went up a, another level. He said just the proteins in an amoeba, uh, he came up in one and one followed by 40,000 zeros, and he actually rejected evolution. We'll talk about him some more tonight. Because, I mean, he's a classic example of someone who rejected evolution, but unfortunately that didn't lead him to becoming a Christian. And so uh, if anybody in here is interested in science, it is so tempting just to, just to hammer on the science, you know, just, and just make the person realize there is absolutely no way scientifically they can believe in evolution. And if you walk away with a smile on you, or if I, you know, I mean, I'll accuse me, you know, I'm, I'm probably more guilty than anybody, uh, but if, if we walk away with a smile on our face after we've done that, realizing, okay, I just totally convinced that person evolution can't work, and we don't follow up, you know, have no idea where they're going to end up. And so, uh, so we'll talk about that some tonight. Uh, and then uh, Harold Morowitz did some calculations, basically just showing that even a simple organism uh, kind of coming together would be about one in one followed by 100 billion zeros. But that's just the chemicals coming together. Again, uh, we were talking some at the break. I mean, there's so much about life we don't understand because, you know, the instant something dies, you know, the chemicals are all there, but it's not alive. So, so how do you know? How do we explain that? We're not even touching that yet. You know, we we're just talking about the chemicals. You know, not not really even what would be considered, uh, you know, you know, something that was actually what we would consider alive. So, just another thought. You know, you can just look at okay, the atheists themselves. These are the numbers that they're coming up with. Um, so next, I'm going to talk a little bit about information in the genome. Again, had that analogy. Uh, how do I get all of that information in the genome? So say we start with a bacteria. So we know bacteria is not going to make itself a simple life. But say we start with that. Well, how does that somehow turn itself into all the other life that we see around us? And you know, one way to think about that is that uh, evolution just requires this unimaginably large addition of genetic information. Uh, and natural selection uh, acting on mutations is either neutral or results in a loss of information. Okay, so that's key. So I'm going to hit that from about 10 different angles, and this is one really do hope everybody can understand, because I think this is a key one. A lot of times people have been told, they've seen it on TV shows, you know, read it in magazines, that uh, Christians don't believe in natural selection. You know, and obviously we believe in natural selection. I mean, it's something that's very, uh, but, they, but they'll try to equate natural selection with evolution. And, and, and they're, they're actually kind of the opposite. Because natural selection, you're selecting from existing information. And typically, uh, when existing information is selected from, there's some that's not selected, you end up losing information. And so that evolution requires information you know, be gained. Uh, some of the teacher's editions you'll go through, they'll, uh, one would say, like, well, uh, go down to the pet store. You know, you go down to the pet store, and, you know, there's, there's always a new breed or dog of cat. You know, and, and I don't go to the pet store that often, but I think that's probably true because you just, just looking around the ceiling, there's always some new breed of dog or new breed of cat. And they'll say, well, that's, uh, see, that's just like evolution, you know, getting these new breeds out there. But the point is, is uh, to develop that new breed, the way it's developed is genetic information is actually bred out. And so you're actually losing, losing information. And so when a new breed of dog or cat is developed, it's actually the opposite of evolution. Okay, so this one's a, well, we'll hit it from a lot of different angles, but one way to, uh, maybe another way to think about it, I know a lot of you mentioned you've been on overseas mission trips. Well, if you, uh, um, you ever notice there's a lot of mutts running around on the street? Okay, well, well you know, you're overseas and you're wanting to be polite, so don't call them mutts. You, you call them genetically diverse canines, okay? So, so it, just, it just sounds more formal in there. And so they are very genetically diverse. And so I could take a couple of those, uh, you know, stray dogs, I'll say, because it's easier to say, uh, 
you know, and uh, you take a pair of those, and, and typically they'd have enough genetic information. You could breed either really small dogs from them or really large dogs from them because they have this tremendous diversity of genetic information. Uh, but then the question is, once I develop this really pure breed, a very small dog, uh, can I breed a large dog from it? And once I have that pure breed, uh, I can't do that anymore because I've lost all of that genetic information. And so that'd be a, yeah, just, just another way to think about it. And so we'll, uh, uh, but we'll, we'll go through some examples. Because, uh, again, this is a key point. Because this is, this is, I think, where a lot of people will not want to get in a discussion with you because uh, uh, just the straw men that are thrown out are just incredible as far as well what Christians believe or what the Bible you know teaches and you know the Bible is very clear I mean you, you go back to uh, yeah you know, we all came from uh, Adam and Eve and up to about 50 years ago it was like well see right there we know the Bible's wrong because look at all these different races of people around the world you know so how could we have all come from Adam and Eve uh, well now science advanced you know through genetics we now know that no Adam single man a single woman within their DNA could have been the information to code for all of the physical characteristics of all the people we see on earth today. And that's something we didn't learn until, I mean, we knew it from the Bible, but science didn't develop to the point where we knew it scientifically until fairly recently. And so again, it's a, uh, so again, this, this just, it's just kind of a, a subtle, but it's an important uh, point. The last one I want to mention is uh, you, uh, or just term that we'll talk about more. It's uh, the, the, you open the text, but a lot of times it says, uh, microevolution. And so linguistically, the idea is, uh, you know, and they'll say, oh, that's just a technical term. But, you know, linguistically, you think of, well, boy, if I see microevolution happening, then uh, linguistically, boy, lots of micro gives me macro, right? And so I'll say, well, I see this microevolution. And so if I have lots and lots of microevolution, that must lead to macroevolution. And again, it's completely wrong. I'll give a business analogy for that. Has anybody ever gone to an investment seminar? You don't have to raise your hand on this one. Okay, <laughs> but okay. So you go to the investment seminar. So well, let's pretend this is an investment seminar right now. Um, so if I'm speaking at an investment seminar, what's what's my job? Well, my job is to convince you to give me all your money, right? Okay. So so what I do is, you know, I'll come up here and I'll say, okay, I got this plan. And so say I'm up here and I say, okay, here's here's my plan. We're going to make these little machines. And every time we sell a machine, we're going to lose ten cents. But don't worry, we're going to make it up in volume. Okay, you guys gonna give me all your money? Yeah, hope not. <laughs> yeah, you because know, what happens if every time we sell a machine we lose ten cents? Uh, all that's gonna happen is the more we sell, the faster we go bankrupt, right? And so that's the business analogy. So if I say, okay, I have this microevolution, but when I get into the details, you know, new breeds of dogs and cats, uh, you know, you know, anything I look at, if, if I notice that, wait, this microevolution—it's a slow decrease in information then what's going to happen with that slow de decrease of information over time? Am I going to get macroevolution? It's like, no, I get, I get the opposite. Uh, unfortunately, what, what can happen is species will go extinct. You know, if they lose so much genetic information, that's what we are observing. And so that's, uh, again, a lot of really good detail. A lot of books out there, the one I happen to bring with me uh, that we'll be leaving here is the Genetic Entropy book. Um, so I'll give an example. This is in most of the textbooks. This was out of, a, again, one of the books used in 1998. This was uh, talking about uh, peppered moths, and the story would go that you know, in the, uh, up until the, you know, in the 1850s, these dark gray peppered moths were rare, um, and the reason was is that the trees it kind of looked like birch bark, you know, so birch tree where it's kind of this mottled light and dark uh, bark, and so uh, if this moth was sitting on that tree, it'd be pretty easy for a, a bird to see, and the bird's going to you know come by and it's going to eat that moth. But if this moth is sitting on the tree, well, that's a little harder to see. You know, that kind of camouflages in with uh, birch bark a little bit more. And so, uh, so until the 1850s, these were pretty rare. Uh, these were pretty, you know, relatively common. It's, you know, probably like 95% of the typical form and only 5% of the carbonaria form. But in about 1850, uh, around the industrialized areas where you start getting soot on the birch trees, uh, the bark would turn dark. And now all of a sudden, the birds couldn't see uh, this form as well, and they could see uh, that form. And so they actually, the population density actually flipped. So now you had 95% of the moths being the dark form, and only about 5% being the typical form. Then you, you, uh, you, know, you start putting scrubbers on your smokestacks, you start cleaning things up, uh, the bark goes back to its normal color, it flips back. Okay, and so, uh, and so 
And so now, again, you're back to where 95% of the moths are the light colored and only about 5% of the dark colored. And so there's two ways to look at this. So evolution would say, well, peppered moths that's showing natural selection, you know, microevolution, you know, again, use it, get that term out there. In action, dark moths are better camouflaged when sitting on soot dark in tree trunks, no escaping eaten. More dark colored moths survive and reproduce. Over time, microevolution leads to macroevolution. And so that would be the typical spin you'd get in a pro-evolution book. Now, from a biblical standpoint, you have the exact same initial observation, right? You say peppered moths show natural selection in, a, in action. Uh, dark moths are better camouflaged than sitting on sit dark and tree trunks, no escape being eaten. More dark colored moths survive and reproduce. Uh, but the key where the two diverge uh, is the genetic information needed to produce both dark and light colored moths was present in the original created kind. And the point is, this is where science is 100% the Christian's friend. Because that genetic information was always there. There was always the genetic information for the typica form. There was always genetic information for the carbonary form. And of course, that's the information that God put there. Uh, and so the example has nothing to do with evolution because there's no new genetic information produced. But that is, uh, that and I think Darwin's finches, which fall in exactly the same category, you know, they talk about beak shapes on Darwin's finches. That information was always there. It has nothing to do with evolution, but those are kind of their two flagships uh, in the textbooks. And so if you get into the science, uh, science is completely on the Christian side. Uh, and you can show in a lot of areas how the science is really opposed to evolution. So is that, is that any, any other angles we should try to hit this one from? Uh, I'll give one more, but is that kind of makes sense? There's a huge difference between natural selection and between evolution. And a lot of times if someone's trying to you know, build a straw man to try to say, well, this is why you can't believe the Bible, uh, they'll try to, uh, that's how they'll try to do it. They'll, they'll try to pretend that natural selection and evolution are identical. And they, and they actually tend to, a lot of times they end up being the opposite. Uh, when you look at the information in the genome. Okay, well then, uh, I think the other one that everyone's uh, probably heard of how bacteria are developing resistance to antibiotics, and that's a true statement. But the way it's usually phrased is bacteria are evolving resistance to antibiotics. Now, you know, I think, uh, again, linguistically, that's an okay use of the word evolution. I mean, we'll, we'll do a design at work, and we'll say, hey, the, you know, or someone will say, I try to avoid using the word, but someone will say, oh, boy, the design sure has evolved a lot over the last year. You know, so it's just a use of the word. But the only reason the design evolved over the last year is because there was a whole bunch of us working on it for the last year trying to, you know, trying to improve it or, you know, it wasn't, uh, uh, but, but anyway, uh, so it sounds subtle, but the point is, yes, bacteria are developing resistance to antibiotics, but if we look at how they're developing that resistance, again, it has nothing to do with evolution. Uh, and so uh, one way to think about it is I, uh, um, if say I'm inv infected with a bacteria and I take an antibiotic, and that antibiotic kills 999 out of 1,000 of the bacteria. So that's a pretty good antibiotic. But my immune system doesn't kill off that last bacteria well, that bacteria is going to recolonize, and now I'm going to be infected, and the, the strain of bacteria I'm infected with is now immune to that antibiotic. But did that have anything to do with evolution? Yeah, nothing at all. Because the information to resist the antibiotic was always there. And so this is key. So it was natural. Now, and there's actually a good chance it's the opposite, because those 999 out of 1,000 I wiped out probably had information in them that that surviving one doesn't have. But, you know, but even without proving that, I know at the very best it's neutral. The very best has nothing to do with evolution. You have a plasmid transfer where bacteria can actually, you know, swap, basically they're swapping uh, loops of, or, of a DNA, you know, small loops. Uh, and so that unfortunately can, can be one way a, a very hazardous bacteria can gain antibiotic resistance. But again, it has nothing to do with evolution because the information was always in the genome. And then the third way bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics is uh, it's, it's typically a loss of information. And so what you'll have would be, uh, you know, say a, a, a control gene is lost. So a bacteria might produce, uh, say, a lot of an enzyme that makes it resistant to, you know, say, penicillin. Well, if it loses that control gene, it's actually weaker now. And by definition, it's lost information because a control gene is, would be considered information. If it loses that, uh, and it also tends to be weaker than the other bacteria unless uh, they're all infecting someone that happens to get treated by penicillin. Now, instead of wasting all of this energy producing this enzyme, 
uh, it now becomes the most uh, fit bacteria for that environment uh, because it needs that enzyme basically to resist the fact that person is being treated by penicillin. So it sounds subtle, but what you're doing is you're losing information, uh, losing genetic information, uh, but that can actually make the bacteria more fit. It's analogous to sickle cell anemia. It's analogous to some of the theories associated with blind cave fish. Uh, the example, one of the ideas on blind cave fish uh, is that the, uh, um, you know, if, if eventually the genetic information, you know, if you're down in a cave, you've been, you've been on those cave tours where, you know, they turn off all the lights and you can't see anything. You know, and you put your hand in front of your face and, and you think you see it, but that's just because your brain knows your hand's there. I mean, you're really not seeing your hand if there's absolutely no light in that cave. And uh, so the, uh, so if you think about it, if a fish has an eye down in a cave pond, uh, it's actually less fit than the fish that doesn't have the eye because that eye is uh, uh, it's basically not doing any good because there's no light down there, but it's a weak spot. So if that fish gets in a fight with another fish, that other fish happens to bite it on the eye, well, that was a weak spot. If it's swimming along and it hits its eye on the side of the cave pond, scratches it, gets infected, you know, that's uh, a weakness. And so it's actually going to be a survival advantage if you have what in the real world, you're, you know, outside the cave world, will be this horrible mutation where instead of having an eye there, you have a scale. Uh, well, now all of a sudden, having a scale there down in the cave, that's a, uh, can be a survival advantage. But just uh, depending on how that occurred, if there was a mutation uh, that basically caused the visual system to be lost, you know, eventually it washed out through genetic drift, it had a huge loss of information, but it could still make that fish more fit. Uh, again, when you look at sickle cell anemia, that's analogous. The bacteria are analogous. You can have like a, a, a nutrient uptake system that mutates and isn't as efficient. But if the nutrient it was going to uptake was an antibiotic, it actually makes it more survivable. Uh, and so, uh, so that's why a lot of times, you, know, you notice the superbugs, they, only live, they tend to live in hospitals because that's when the antibiotics have taken out all of the competing bacteria. And a lot of doctors now, they'll try to get people out of the hospital as quickly as possible, even if they have an infection. Get them out and let the natural bacteria take out the the, the quote unquote superbug because the natural ones are tend to be well they're certainly stronger outside of that hospital environment. But you can again you can go back to the information level and you notice that these a lot of these examples for evolution are actually showing the opposite of evolution. And that's the one those are, to me is really ironic when we'll teach someone oh yeah here's an example of evolution and you're actually showing a loss of information. You know we're showing them the opposite of evolution but still spinning it to somehow you know they'll be kind of silly statements like, oh, well, evolution is just change, and we see change, therefore we see evolution. And no, it's not, I mean, you can define evolution that way, but again, we're talking about where's a person putting their faith? I mean, are they thinking that they just made themselves, or do they realize that they're created in God's image? And it's a huge impact, you know, not only on their physical life on earth, but also on their eternity. So it's a really important question, and it's just, uh, uh, so it's, you know, again, something we need to, you really need to be able to discuss. So everybody comfortable, the difference between natural selection Evolution, microevolution, macroevolution. Okay. And again, we'll, you know, catch, catch me at dinner if there's any, any uh, you know, other angle you'd uh, like to try to look at some. Then just you can talk about you know, breeding and natural selection. Uh, now, where this leads, and this is a really important societal question. So, you know, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 17 through 20 says, If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the reason this is important is that we all have uh, a different set of mutations. And so one way, the biblically consistent way to think about this is, you know, Adam and Eve were created perfect. Uh, when God said at the end of Genesis 1 that, you know, creation was very good. Yeah, that's, so they're created genetically perfect. Since Adam sinned, you have uh, mutations and natural selection acting. And we've all ended up with a different set of mutations. So we are all unique. And from, a, from the important point of you know, taking the spiritual viewpoint, I mean, that's great. You know, when we look at it spiritually, but we'll show in the next few slides, it's going to have, if society becomes focused on the physical, it can have really horrible consequences. But uh, we need to realize that we're all unique. And I'll, give a, I'll just give an example here to, to see what's happening. Is, you know, say you... Uh, uh, I don't know, I'll, I'll use cars, usually use cars. So say you went out and you designed the perfect car. Okay, so you have the perfect car, and you 
write the manual for making the perfect car. Okay, so with me, you, got, you, you just designed the perfect car. You write the manual for making the perfect car. Make a thousand copies of that manual. Okay, so now I have a thousand copies of that manual. Uh, and then just randomly change a hundred words in each of those manuals. And there's a very similar analogy uh, again given in the genetic entropy book. So, uh, so you, okay, so now you randomly changed a hundred words in each of those manuals. Now go ahead and make your cars. Okay, now, so what's going to happen? You make these thousand cars. Uh, well, some of the cars, uh, you, you know, it depends on what the change is. I mean, if one of the hundred words you change, say it puts the engine on the roof. Uh, are you going to like that car? You're probably not going to like that car, right? So the engine's on the roof, so it's kind of useless. So you can't live with that. But say it just makes a, it makes it so only half of the floor has carpet on it or something. Uh, well, okay. I wouldn't have wanted it that way, but I can live with that. Okay, so so you... Uh, so say you've made 1,500 cars, use that as a number, get rid of the 500 you like the least, keep the 1,000 that you like the most, and then do the same process. And so what this represents is you start out with Adam and Eve's perfect genetics. Uh, each generation we're getting between 100 and 1,000 mutations accumulating. Uh, and then there is natural selection. That's selection pressure actually where you only picked 1,000 out of 1,500. That's too high of a selection pressure for most mammals. The species wouldn't survive, but that would be natural selection. So that's, that's where the analogy is going. Okay, so now so I've picked the cars that I uh, can live with, I guess you'd say, or I still kind of like make 1,000 copies of those manuals, uh, now change another 100 words. So now each manual has had 200 words changed in it, but again, they're different 200 words. Okay, understand? Because they each have their own set of random mutations. Again, so we all have our own set of random mutations. Uh, and then, yeah, you, know, you can still have the survival of the fittest. And uh, yeah, if I want to go back to the evolution discussion, uh, one thing you think about, you know, after, after I do this 100 times, I've now changed 10,000 words in each manual, right? Uh, you know, and they're all random, so they all have a different 10,000 words changed. Uh, so I guess the question could be is how long is it going to take me to turn my car into a jet airplane doing this? Yeah. That's, that's not the direction we're going, right? You know, what really happens is you get what they call error catastrophe, where pretty soon, at some point, I'll have, I won't have a manual left uh, that can uh, create a functioning car. And so that's, again, you know, that's where this idea of mutation and natural selection leads to. And it's just using a, a different way of looking at it. Uh, but again, those are actually very you know, realistic numbers you know, that, that are, we're, we're talking about. So that's, uh, uh, I mean, not to go too tangential, but it's just to me, it's just totally ironic. Every other field of science, uh, if you're working with chemicals that cause mutations, if you're working with radiation that causes mutations, it is so highly regulated. And they so uh, try so hard to minimize the exposure to mutagens, uh, except evolution. You know, evolution, we're supposed to be, oh, no, these things are good for us over time. Yeah, yeah just, it's, it's just the, the disconnect, just, just amazing. Um, I don't know how, how else to describe that. Uh, you can run standard population models. Uh, using this, uh, using reasonable assumptions, and again, these are not, these are just standard, uh, uh, you know, using standard population genetics modeling, you can make reasonable assumptions so that, uh, you know, just if God wasn't intervening, if God wasn't sustaining his creation, we'd be extinct in 350 generations. Uh, and, you, were, you know, it's been about 231 generations since Adam and Eve, you know, if you go, you know, just, again, you have to make some assumptions, but using both the information that's in the Bible and Assumptions since then. So again, it's a, you know, just the. Uh, uh, I, I want to emphasize on this: this is not taking into account God sustaining His creation, but just using their models, you know, their assumptions. Yeah, you, know, you get that we would go extinct fairly, fairly quickly. Um, and so uh, now, uh, again, in the genetic entry book, they do talk about you know some people try to uh, come up with ways around this problem. They have what they call the mutation count mechanism, synergistic epistasis mechanism, uh, gene duplication, and polyploidy. Is a really, you know, just good case for each one. Why they actually make the problem worse for the evolutionist, you know. And so, but it's again, a, you know, I won't go into details here, but it's a good write-up. And there's a lot of harmful effects for some of these. I mean, what he's, you know, what some people will say is something like uh, somehow, you know, Down syndrome is is helping. Uh, you know, that's an example of uh, having you know extra copies. This is this gene duplication in polyploidy. And again, it's just everything we've seen is it's, it's the opposite. But it does it doesn't work even if it wasn't the opposite. But again. Uh, uh, we can talk details during the break, or again, it's uh, in that uh, particular book. Uh, so the problem is, those you know, Christians, we're not the only ones uh, that have noticed uh, that there's mutations accumulating in the genome. 
Uh, but the non-Christian solutions are really frightening because you'll actually talk to people. And if you get to, I'd say it, if, uh, it's, really, it's really hard to find a totally consistent, rational atheist because that person, you can think of all the implications it have. But I've had talked to some that really try hard. But unfortunately, the, hard, the closer they get to, you know, what would atheism have me do, uh, the more you get things like survival of the fittest or compassion being bad. I mean, so in other words, survival of the fittest is, is all you should focus on, and compassion actually ends up being bad. Because a lot of times they'll work around to think, well, okay, maybe with atheism, then the job is to have the human race. They'll, they'll still think we're somehow going to improve physically. So they'll say that, okay, we need to get, help the humans evolve as quickly as possible. Uh, then a lot of them will realize, well, no, it's, we're not seeing things getting better. Uh, so then they'll say, well, okay, as atheists, our job is to keep uh, humans from physically, you know, minimize how fast humans are physically degrading. I mean, this is on a generation per generation basis. And so, uh, so they start thinking about that. Well, they immediately conclude that compassion is bad. Uh, you just have to be real hardcore, you know, uh, uh, survival of the fittest. Otherwise, you're going to accelerate the rate that the human species. I mean, it gets scary talking to these people. But you, unfortunately, I think it's going to get more and more prevalent. Um, so, you, so again, totally the opposite of the Bible. Um, there's talk about genetic screening before being allowed to have children, societal screening before being allowed to have uh, children. Uh, but all of these, if, if we uh, lose focus on what's important, uh, you know, the important thing is people's eternity. We are created in God's image. If we start losing focus on that, it's not, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a, you know, a harmless, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it's very far from being harmless, I guess. Uh, this was a, a quote out of uh, MIT's uh, technology review, a little over three years old, but it's talking about a new safe technology for genetically testing unborn babies. And this is going to be, yeah, we see, we've always seen this with technology, some very good applications for this technology, because uh, if there's an unborn baby is going to be uh, prone to certain uh, illnesses, then there's a good chance that they can treat the baby in utero, that they'll be prepared for those you know, uh, issues when the baby is born. Uh, and so those would be the good uses. But, uh, and then he talked about how say, I think we could see 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of American pregnancies getting genetic testing. Because uh, again, I think it literally just takes a blood sample from the mother. It's very simple, very safe. Uh, some of the older methods had a lot of risk, and so a lot of people wouldn't have it uh, tested. But then, uh, so you start getting these these uh, people realizing the implications here. So one of the ones, and I think this was even before this test, but Arizona made it illegal to abort based on sex or race. Uh, but they haven't said anything about what people might call, consider perceived genetic imperfections. Uh, we support some missionaries down in New Zealand, and they, uh, their daughter, uh, she was, uh, you know, in utero, they said, well, your daughter's going to be born with Down syndrome. And they got this huge pressure to have an abortion. I mean, just they said it was just unbelievable the pressure that they could not convince the doctors that there's no way we're going to have an abortion. They're Christians, you know, and uh, yeah, it turned out their daughter actually didn't have Down syndrome, which is even more ironic. Uh, but just the fact that again, people are already using this genetic testing to try to say, and so you'll have uh, there are certain European countries now that are bragging that uh, we've had no, you know, no one born with this particular. Defect. I think a lot of times they're, they're, they're really picking on Down syndrome right now. But they'll, uh, um, and, and, and you'll think, well, wow, you must have really advanced medically. But no, it's actually horrific. I mean, it literally means they've, you know, they've, they've basically killed, you know, anyone that, that might have that particular syndrome. And so, you know, where would that stop? Uh, but to me, what's so ironic about Arizona is uh, if, if the unborn baby is human, which we know the unborn babies are human, then why is abortion allowed at all, right? I mean, I mean, why? You know, how could you even contemplate abortion if that unborn baby somehow wasn't human? Like some people try to tell us, then if it's not human, well, why do you care about race or sex or it's not human, right? I mean, if you're trying to put yourself in there, so it's a very inconsistent religion, uh, and then it's having some very inconsistent laws. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? In other words, if if the baby's human, then the baby's and the baby is human, you know. But but some of them try to say, well, no, the baby's not really human, so therefore you're allowed to kill it, but you can only kill it under these conditions. And it and it's just sick to even think about and talk about. But it's something that we're all going to be uh, you know, faced with and just have to, to decide how we're going to respond. Um, this is uh, not new. Now, in the first session, we did the biblical 
analogy, you know, going back about 3,000 years. This goes back about 100 years, and they didn't have the technology. But this was some of the things that were, had become accepted science and were being taught in our science textbooks. And you can see where us, a lot of this led. So this is a quote. Uh, this is uh, Hunter's uh, Civic Biology, one of the most widely used uh, U.S. biology textbooks before World War II. Uh, actually, you can still get copies. Uh, have a copy. It's actually used in the Detroit public school systems. Okay, so you guys have a little Detroit public school system stamp in it. Uh, it says, uh, if such people were lower animals, we would probably kill them off to prevent them from spreading. Humanity will not allow this, but we do have the remedy of separating the sexes in asylums or in other places and in various ways preventing the intermarriage and the possibilities of perpetuating such a low and degenerate race. Remedies of this sort have been tried successfully in Europe and are now meeting with success in this country. Okay, this is a science textbook. Okay, and they're talking basically about eugenics and yeah, trying to you know, preserve you know, what they would call the you know, superior traits. This was uh, 1914. Uh, and you notice it's the same kind of peer pressure. You know, you know, how, remember like the Bill Nye quote where he starts out about, you know, the United States is unique, United States is unique and it's the denial of evolution. Well, here's the same thing. Well, Met tried successfully in Europe and now meeting with success in this country. So it's, again, it's kind of the peer pressure, you know. I mean, boy, we got to keep up. You know, we got we to gotta buy into this. Uh, the interesting thing about, you know, if the atheists were right, then Hunter would have been right. You know, you know, we wouldn't have any free will and the rulers of society, you know, you know, they'd be in charge of who's superior and who's not. I mean, if he was right, he's wrong. But if, if he and the atheists were right, then, then you know, that statement wouldn't be uh, outrageous. Uh, what does the Bible say about children? Psalm 127, 3 through 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies. The okay. you know, Bible very, you know, obviously, you know, pro-family, pro-children. Uh, you look at what uh, some in society say about children. This is, uh, well, the Bible says about abortion, Mark 10, 19. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother, Revelation 21, 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So again, the Bible is very clear on, on abortion. Um, but now let's read some quotes uh, from famous pro well, pro-abortion people. This is Margaret Sanger. She founded Planned Parenthood. Uh, and her uh, Women in the New Race, uh, she published in 1920, says, the most merciful thing that the large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Okay, so she's talking about actually killing infants. You know, not just abortion, but killing infants. Uh, and you think, well, how can anybody be that sick? I mean, I don't know how to phrase it. But again, step back, put in yourself in that mindset. If, if they're thinking purely physical, uh, not thinking about the spiritual, not realizing that we are created in God's image. Uh, I'm not saying even then it would seem pretty sick, but it's still, you can almost see where they're coming from. You know, and so it's, uh, and so that's again the importance of, we talk about any of this, use it to get a person into the Bible. You know, use it to get them to obey the gospel, because that's that's really the fundamental uh, tipping point of the fundamental difference. She had a uh, a plan for peace, a birth control review. Uh, the purpose of the American Baby Code shall be to provide for a better distribution of babies and to protect society against the propagation and increase of the unfit. Article 4, no woman shall have the legal right to bear a child and no man shall have the right to become a father without a permit. Article 6, no permit for parenthood shall be valid for more than one uh, birth. You know, so again, it's, uh, uh, you know, these are the ideas that are being floated today. You know, mentioned that, that show, that's uh, there's one show talking about how uh, um, you know, now, again, you know, you know, it's the same thing, you know, limiting, you know, how many children, you know, can be had and, you know, possibly who gets permission to have those children. I mean, just, you know, it's, you know trying to socialize the idea. But, again, this is nothing new. This is, you know, 80, 100 years ago. Uh, but, again, it was the same, uh, uh, same type of approach. Um, this is another quote. This was uh, Women, Morality, and Birth Control. Uh, from 1922, says we should hire three or four colored ministers, preferably with social service backgrounds, with emerging, engaging personalities, the most successful educational approach to the Negro is through a religious appeal. We don't want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. So there's a real racist comment, and a lot of people you know, still feel that uh, uh, this particular organization, that's you know, one of their goals. Uh, and so it's, uh, but again, you look at the, uh, um, you know, again, just, just where this, uh, where it leads when a person develops a, a non-biblical philosophy, I guess would be a way to, to phrase it. Uh, but again, uh, was she a free thinker? Or was she just acting upon what she had been taught? Uh, this is, uh, 
again, that same book, uh, uh, Hunter of Civic Biology, says, at the present time there exist upon the earth five races or varieties of man, each very different from the other in instincts, social customs, and to an extent in structure. These are the Ethiopian or Negro type originating in Africa, the Malay or brown race from the islands of the Pacific, the American Indian, the Mongolian or yellow race, including the natives of China, Japan, and the Eskimos, and finally the highest type of all. Catch that, you know, just read it kind of fast. The highest type of all, uh, the Caucasians, represented by civilized white inhabitants of Europe and America. And so, again, very racist statement. This was being taught as science. And then that was being used to then uh, you know, justify, you know, people would say, well, why did the U.S. have such a problem with racism? Well, a lot, of, a lot of the times we were struggling with racism, you could go back and the people actually thought it was scientific. You know, I mean, they'd read it in their science textbook. And again, this was one of the most widely used uh, textbooks in the U.S. So she might have been just acting on what she'd been taught. And maybe that was about the right time. And maybe that's what she'd learned in high school. You know, it was, uh, you know, nonsense like this. Uh, but then you go back a little further. Well, you know, is Hunter a racist or is he just uh, doing what he was told in science? You go back to Charles Darwin. Uh, this is in The Descent of Man. And, and the, probably the most, one of the most deceptive rebuttals I'd ever heard of this was uh, said Darwin uh, never mentioned races in Origin of the Species. So did you catch that one? He, he mentioned it in Descent of Man. And so, again, there's a lot of deception that goes on here. But this is Charles Darwin. Uh, it's important because a lot of he's in some circles almost deified. Uh, but to do that, you know, you should probably have his, you know, his, what, where his belief system led him to. So this was his quote. He says, uh, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes will no doubt be exterminated. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, as we may hope, even in the Caucasian. And some ape as low as a baboon, instead of now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. So you read that, you let that sink in. That is, the, I mean, he can't get any more racist. You know, and, and what's even worse is he's very eloquent about being extremely racist. And so uh, my wife uh, taught at middle school, and, uh, and actually it was pretty supportive of Christianity, I'll give him that. But she said something like, yeah, I was going to put a quote from Charles Darwin up to see what the kids thought. And, oh yeah, Charles Darwin, you know, and then uh, and then she mentioned that well, probably should put this quote up, and yeah, it didn't didn't fly, you know, you know, it is because obviously it's completely, it's just wrong, you know, and it's certainly something where, uh, I mean, it's worse than wrong. It's again just from it's just really horrible from any standpoint you think about it. But this is what this individual believed, and you never hear about that. It's always like oh, this, this great scientist, or you know, or, or however they try to spin uh, Charles Darwin. Uh, he also has a couple few pages leading up to these. Uh, uh, Little quotes, uh, the average mental power in man must be above that of woman. Uh, thus man has ultimately become superior to woman in poetry, strength, voice, etc. So again, he, uh, he, you know, using his, the theory he came up with, you know, came up with some, he really just came out with his, you know, kind of his uh, racist and sexist belief, but then tried to pretend that some of those beliefs were scientific. Go a step further. Um, and again, it's just where some of Sanger's contemporaries were really that far removed from the intellectual positions. So you just read those two statements. So when Margaret Sanger says we should apply a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of population whose progeny is tainted or whose inheritance is such that objectionable traits may be transmitted to offspring, well, when she said that, you know, she's really just building on Darwin and Heckel and you know, all the others because that was their philosophy. Uh, when Adolf Hitler said, if nature does not wish that weaker individuals should mate with the stronger, she wishes even less that a superior race should intermingle with an inferior one, because in such cases all her efforts throughout hundreds of thousands of years to establish the evolutionary higher stage of being may thus be rendered futile. And so again, uh, you know, we focus on the spiritual implications of these false religions, and that's really where we, we, you know, we need to focus there because that's a person's eternity. But when getting a person to uh, think about this, they, you know, they can look back in history and see where these false religions have led. And this belief in evolution has, uh, even 100 years ago, you know, uh, helped uh, lead to some very you know, horrific uh, events and some very horrific uh, consequences. And so I will cl close with that quote I mentioned, uh, you know, false science, and that there's no other way to phrase it. You know, we say true science is a Christian's friend, and that is 100% across the board. We'll talk a lot more about that after dinner. Uh, but false science, it's, it's really, it's often used to claim evil is good and good is evil. And Isaiah 5, 20 through 23 tells us that. It says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who 
put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe to men mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous man. So there's a couple of things. You know, we're starting to see, uh, you know, some universities, you know, some places in this country, um, you know, basically justice is being taken away from the righteous man. I mean, there's this huge effort now. You, you, you try to squelch freedom of speech. You know, you know, yeah, I come here and I know, hey, we can have this discussion. It's interactive. Anybody can come. Uh, you have a lot of these talks. They've always stayed very, um, I just say very uh, how rational, and you know, even even if you know, we get some really good discussions going before. But you know, if, if we keep going down the path uh, that we're going, and uh, free speech continues to get squelched, when that free speech you know disagrees with whoever happens to be controlling that particular area, I mean, it'd be a time when we wouldn't be able to have this kind of discussion. And so, uh, and so that last uh, down in verse 23, it says, "And take away justice from the righteous man." That's, uh, I mean, we've already seen evidence where people. Uh, being asked to do something that violates uh, their beliefs, uh, you know, they're getting taken to court, they're getting sued. So we're all see, already seeing that happening. But I think really just going back up to verse 20, uh, we're seeing a lot of people call evil good and good evil. And that's, uh, and a lot of times they'll try to use uh, false science to somehow claim they have a scientific basis for that. And so it's not really something we can just be comfortable with. Obviously, the only thing we can realize is, you know, people were struggling with this 100 years ago. Unfortunately, a lot of that did lead up to a lot of the atrocities that occurred during World War II. Uh, but we're, we're dealing with it again now. So uh, with that, uh, go ahead and close. And I think uh, uh, after dinner, we'll do uh, assumptions in the age of the earth. But really appreciate your attention. And um, I guess what, what I'll let you, uh, Don, just mention whatever the procedure is now. I, I ended a little early last time, so I wanted to make up for it by running long this time. So, help, you know, try to be fair. <laughs>